Looking back through history, there are many strange events that have baffled people at the time and continue to do so today. While many of these mysteries will never be solved, many others are still being investigated in hopes that we will understand them better one day. Number 10. Before his strange and unexplained disappearance in February of 1896, Albert Fountain had lived a very interesting life that included traveling to several countries where he worked as a tutor. In 1861, he became a member of the Union Army, during which time he participated in the conquest of Arizona and the Battle of Apache Pass. It would also be during this time that he met his wife, Mariana Perez, and the couple would eventually make a home in El Paso, Texas with their nine children. Years later, in 1869, he would become a member of the Texas Senate, and in 1875, he moved his family to Mesilla in New Mexico, where he became a lawyer, famously representing Billy the Kid, the infamous outlaw, after he was captured. During that same decade, he moved once again, this time to Las Cruces, where he worked diligently to bring land fraudsters to justice. His reputation would then see him being elected to the New Mexico legislature, and soon after that, he would be appointed as Speaker of the House. In 1894, he was responsible for ensuring the conviction of 20 cattle rustlers, but his reputation soon ensured that he had a lot of enemies, many of whom had been sent to prison thanks to his talents. Many people believe that this is why he mysteriously disappeared, and investigators believe that foul play was involved. But to this day, no one knows what happened to Fountain, and his case remains a mystery. What is known is that on the 1st of February, 1896, Fountain and his son Henry had been traveling home to Mesilla from Lincoln in New Mexico, and they were nearing the end of their trip after traveling via Buckboard, an open horse-drawn carriage, for three days in very cold conditions. As they arrived in the White Sands area, it was starting to get dark, and it would be here that he and Henry suddenly vanished. The following morning, the tracks of Fountain's carriage were found along with hoof prints of unidentified horses, and a search was quickly organized. Following the tracks, one searcher found a handkerchief that was believed to have biological material on it, along with a nickel and a dime that had been tied into the same handkerchief. The tracks led searchers to the Jarius Mountains where Fountain's carriage was finally discovered, but there was no sign of either him or Henry. Many more people would join in the search over the next few days, and the story would be featured in several newspapers, but Fountain remained missing. Pinkerton investigators were certain that he'd lost his life at the hands of a man named Oliver Lee and his accomplices, James Gilliland and Bill McNew, who were among the cattle rustlers that were sent to prison thanks to Fountain. McNew never stood trial, but both Lee and Gilliland faced a grand jury three years after the incident. But the evidence that was presented by the prosecution was found to be circumstantial, and after deliberating for just eight minutes, the jury returned a verdict of not guilty. No other suspects were ever identified, and while it was believed that Fountain and his son had perished, this could never be proven as they were never found. Lee and McNew maintained their innocence until they eventually passed away and since no new evidence was ever found, the case has never been solved and likely never will be. Number 9. There are many places on our planet that are said to have mystical properties that can heal the sick, where strange, unexplained sightings have taken place, or where people have reported having spiritual experiences. El Santuario de Chimayo, a Roman Catholic church located in Chimayo, New Mexico, is believed by many to be one of these locations, and its strange history begins in 1810, on the day of Good Friday, the 22nd of April. Though the story has never been confirmed, it is said that on that day, a group of men in the area suddenly became aware of a strange light that caught their attention from an area close to the Santa Cruz River, and they decided to investigate. When they reached the area, they realized that the light was emanating from the ground, and they started to dig to find its source, which they discovered to be a wooden crucifix that was named Our Lord Escapulas. They left the uncovered crucifix where it was, and immediately told the local priest about what they had found. The priest then traveled to the area and recovered the treasure, taking it back to the church for safekeeping. But the following morning, he was shocked to discover that it had disappeared, 
and he immediately started searching for it. Inexplicably, he would find the crucifix once more, back in the same spot where it had been found in the first place. He would take it back to the church twice more, only to have it disappear and be found back in the same spot again. When news of these strange events started to spread, people in the area started to believe that the spot where the crucifix was found must be sacred, and a shrine, El Centuario de Shamaya, was built around it. It soon came to light that the church had been built near another mystical area that once contained a mud that was believed to possess healing properties. The man who built the church confirmed these rumors, stating that he'd been healed by the mud on one occasion. Some sources state that the miracle sand was discovered by a man who was cultivating his field during the fall harvest. He suddenly had a vision, during which he was told to look at the dirt under his plow, and it was then that the extraordinary mud was found. Soon enough, word of this miraculous dirt started to spread, and people from all over Mexico started swarming to the area in hopes that they could benefit from its miraculous powers. This had resulted in a pilgrimage that takes place on Good Friday every year, with as many as 300,000 people visiting the site from all over the world. Many of these believers take some of the dirt with them when they leave, but it's always replaced by dirt from the surrounding hills, though some people believe that the sand is replenished by a holy power. Tests have been conducted to determine whether the soil really does have healing powers, and they revealed that it contains carbonates that are known to relieve the symptoms of heartburn. People have been known to rub the dirt on their skin, drink it in their tea, or sprinkle it on their food before praying at the site. Though most people who visit the site believe the soil to be holy, others believe that it isn't the soil that heals the sick, but rather their own belief that it'll work, much like placebo. But there have, however, been reports of people who have been healed, such as a girl from Texas who was given a very short time to live, but made a full recovery after visiting the site. Whether the soil is responsible for these recoveries or not is debatable, but there's no doubt that El Santuario de Shamayo is the site of a mystery that has no solid explanation. Number 8. We've all seen horror movies depicting people who are said to have been possessed by an evil entity. And while we carry on with our everyday lives once the movie is over, there are some truly disturbing accounts of hauntings and apparent possession dating back hundreds of years. Whether you believe these accounts to be true or not, they're very real to the people involved. And although many have come forward to share their experiences, there are some cases that are more obscure since they happened a long time ago. One of these cases involves an 18-year-old woman named Esther Cox who lived in Nova Scotia, Canada during the latter part of the 19th century. And while the residents of Amherst are very familiar with the account, so much so that a festival is held in her honor every year, it isn't as well known in other parts of the world. Esther's ordeal started when she agreed on a night out with a man named Bob McNeil, but the evening didn't go as planned as he became very aggressive towards her while they were riding in his carriage. Esther told him to take her home, which he thankfully did, after which he left town. But it seems that this event was the catalyst for the strange events that followed in Esther's home. The first sign of trouble came when a box containing pieces of fabric shifted out from under her bed without explanation and lifted into the air in front of her. She also suffered from convulsions, and on one occasion, just after she and her sister had gone to bed, she jumped up and started screaming that something was wrong with her. Her sister, Jenny, was horrified to see that her skin was turning red and that she was swelling up for no reason. The rest of the family rushed into the room to help, but it was only after four loud bangs could be heard coming from under Esther's bed that the swelling stopped and she stopped screaming. She then fell into a deep sleep as if she'd experienced a deep sense of relief. Everything would return to normal for a few days, but on the fourth night, the same scenario played out again, and her family decided that Esther needed professional help since they were at a loss as to what was happening. A local doctor, Dr. Carright, was summoned to the house, and he would soon report seeing objects moving in the room without explanation, and confirmed the sound of banging coming from under her bed. He stated that the most frightening event was when he became aware of a scratching noise from the wall above her head, and when he looked up, he saw the words, Esther Cox, your mind to kill, scratched into the plaster. She attempted to spare her family from these strange events by moving to a nearby farm, but the activity followed her there, 
and before long, a barn on the property burned down. The farmer believed Esther was responsible and had her arrested for arson, after which she spent a month in prison. When she returned home, the activity started to fade away, and she would eventually go on to live a normal life. But to this day, no one is able to explain why these events happened or why they stopped after she served her stint in jail for something she supposedly had no control over. Number 7. Archaeologists have made some truly strange discoveries over the years, and many of these seem to have no explanation. But some bizarre discoveries are made by ordinary people, as is evidenced by a case that took place in Edinburgh, Scotland in 1836. It all started when a group of boys decided to go out hunting for rabbits one day in an area called Arthur's Seat. While they were climbing a hill in the area, they came across a small cave that they didn't know existed, and naturally they decided to investigate. They then stumbled upon three slabs of slate, and when they moved them, they were surprised to find that 17 small coffins had been placed underneath. When they opened these coffins, they were even more baffled, as they were found to contain tiny wooden carved figures. They would later reveal that there were two layers of coffins, eight in each, and that one coffin had been placed on top of these, suggesting that it was somehow special compared to the others. Furthermore, the figures measured around 3.5 inches in height and were dressed in outfits that had been made by hand. These were then glued onto the figures, but no one could understand what their purpose was or who had left them in the cave. Once word about the strange discovery got out, newspapers started reporting that the figures were somehow connected to witchcraft or demons. They also suggested that the figures were supposed to represent the witch's victims and that a powerful spell had been cast against them. But others were more level-headed, suggesting that the figures were placed in the cave as a tribute to those who passed away while far away from home. It was also suggested that they'd been placed there by the wives of sailors who considered this to be a Christian burial, since they were most likely lost at sea and could not be brought back home. Many of the tiny coffins were lost when the boys who made the discovery destroyed them, but at least eight survived and were passed along to the Museum of the Society of Antiquities of Scotland. Strangely, a woman who lived in Edinburgh would come forward years later with a strange tale. She claimed that a man had visited her father on several occasions and that he'd shown him drawings of three small coffins. He had to do this since he was mute. The three coffins were dated 1837, 1838, and 1840, and perhaps by coincidence, one of his relatives died in each of those years, including his cousin and his brother. After the last of the three funerals had concluded, the same man appeared again, gave her father a knowing look, and then vanished, never to be seen again. Though many people believe this man somehow hexed the woman's father through the coffins, others believe that they're merely talismans of good luck that were left in the cave by past residents. It's a strange mystery that seemingly has no definitive answers, and it's very unlikely that we'll ever know why the figures were carved or by whom. Number 6. Most of us are aware of the rule that when you visit a historical site, you're not supposed to touch anything, let alone pick it up or take it home with you. But Zayla, the wife of Lord Alexander Seton, who lived on Learmouth Gardens in Edinburgh, was seemingly unaware of this, which resulted in some very strange events taking place at the couple's home. In 1936, they decided to take a trip to Egypt, and while there, they visited a tomb that had just been discovered by archaeologists that still had the deceased mummy's remains intact. Zayla was so intrigued by the sight that she decided to pick up a small piece of bone and she brought it home with her. Upon returning to Edinburgh, they displayed the artifact for all to see, but before long, they realized that this was a mistake. The first strange occurrence came just after the couple had finished having dinner with some of their friends, who'd been shown the bone fragment. As they were leaving, they heard a loud crashing sound, and a few moments later, the parapet from the house's roof smashed onto the ground just a few feet away from the group. The couple's nanny would report a few nights later that she heard someone walking through the house at night, specifically in the drawing room, but although a search was conducted, nothing was found. On another occasion, the couple woke to find that a table in the house had been pushed aside, causing a candle to fall to the floor. But more alarmingly, the bone fragment was found lying next to it. 
When Satin's nephew visited the couple for a few days, he reported seeing someone dressed in strange clothing walking up a staircase in the house. And although the boy didn't seem frightened, Satin decided to stay up since he thought someone may be trying to break into the drawing room, which contained some valuable items. When nothing happened for most of the night, he decided to go to bed, only to be awoken by their nanny's screams coming from downstairs. She stated that she'd heard someone in the locked drawing room, and when they entered, they found it in disarray, with chairs lying on their sides, books lying on the floor, and once again, the bone lying in the middle of the room. Satin had to unlock the door to get in, and to his surprise, he found that all the windows were still locked too, and they were at a loss as to how someone could have gained entry to the room without breaking a window. Desperate for answers, they consulted a soothsayer, but she found no answers and left without resolving the mystery. Seton felt that the bone was responsible and suggested that they destroy it, but Zayla refused. Newspapers started reporting on the strange tale, and people had all sorts of theories as to what was causing the strange events. But the family was no closer to ending their ordeal until Seton received a letter from Dr. Carter, an archaeologist, who explained that the bone was responsible for these events and that they will continue until it was either destroyed or returned to its tomb. He asked a priest to exorcise the bone, after which it was destroyed, much to Zayla's dismay. But as soon as this was done, the activity stopped and the household returned to normal. Seton would later state that he was convinced that the bone fragment was cursed somehow, and that Zayla was responsible for bringing these alarming events into their home. Number 5. Uttlesford, a town in Essex, became the site of a very strange string of sightings in 1669. And while no one had an explanation for what they saw at the time, we're no closer to unraveling the mystery today. Hinnom, also known as Hinnom on the Mount, since it's situated on top of a hill, contained many farms, one of which was called The Lodge. This property was situated close to a wooded area named Birchwood, thanks to the many birch trees that grew there. And it's here that many people reported seeing a serpent-like creature that they could not identify. One man recounted that he'd been traveling in the area on his horse when he encountered this creature, and he became so frightened that he immediately bolted back to town to report what he had seen. Soon after that, two more men reported seeing the serpent, but stated that they were too scared to get anywhere near it. They did have a good idea of where it could be found, though, and local farmers were hopeful that they could track it down, though it isn't known whether they ever attempted to do so. Some sources state that a group of men did track the creature down while wielding clubs and walking sticks, but they were too afraid to attack it since it reared up about two feet from the ground as they approached and it seemed to challenge them to a fight. Witnesses who had run-ins with the creature described it as being around 9 feet long, and that it had piercing eyes, large teeth, as well as small wings on its back. But it seemed that these were of little use, as it seemed incapable of flight. Its body was thick and tubular, with the thinnest part being about the size of a man's lower leg, while its midsection was described as about the size of a man's thigh. Following these sightings, a pamphlet was released detailing the encounters and describing the beast in detail, causing quite a stir among people in the area and surrounding communities. This resulted in a yearly festival being held during which people sold small statuettes depicting the serpent, and this tradition remained intact for the following 265 years until the outbreak of the First World War. It's said that it also inspired the creation of a beer called Snakebite, though no reputable source has ever been found to confirm this. Though the legend of the Hinnom Serpent is still spoken about today, not everyone is convinced that it really existed. One reporter, Allison Barnes, claimed that it was an elaborate hoax created by a man named William Winstonley. Barnes believed that Winstonley, along with a few accomplices, built the snake out of tubular pieces of wood and canvas that were then manipulated by one of the men who waited inside. It was also said that Winstonley was responsible for the publishing of the pamphlet in order to create more interest in the snake's existence. Five people who lived in Henham at the time corroborated this theory, as did a police constable and a church warden. And since then, most people believe that the snake was just that, a hoax. But this hasn't ever been definitively proven. There have been many sightings of other large serpent-like creatures in Essex for many years leading many people to believe that the Hinnom Serpent may actually have existed. Number 4. 
The Marriott Dalmahoy Hotel is situated in the lush countryside of Edinburgh in Scotland, and many people travel there to take a break from their daily lives in an idyllic location. But many people have reported that the building isn't as restful as one might expect, since they've seen some very disconcerting sights there, including ghosts. The hotel was once a house that belonged to the Dalmahoy family, who occupied it from 1265 well into the 18th century. Today, the hotel is made up of two wings, one more modern than the other, and visitors stay in rooms that have been named after well-known whiskies. After the Dalmahoy family left the property, it was bought by the Dalrymples, who lived there until 1750, when it was passed on to the hands of James Douglas, the 14th Earl of Morton. The building remained in its original state until 1787, when Alexander Lang added another wing. In 1830, a porch was added to the building's entrance by a man named William Byrne, and later, in the 19th century, its west front had alterations made to it. It was only in 1990 that it was converted into a luxury hotel and spa, which is how it remains today. But guests still report seeing a spirit from back in the day walking through its halls. It's said that the spirit belongs to Lady Mary Douglas, the second daughter of Robert, the 8th Earl of Morton, likely because her portrait still hangs on one of the hotel's walls, making it easy to attribute any strange occurrences to her. Those who have seen the spirit, which has now become known as the White Lady, describe seeing a white female figure floating through the hotel's halls, as if it's trapped in the days gone by. But it's also been reported that she's been seen in one room in particular, the room that Lady Mary Douglas stayed in while she was still alive. While most people would be terrified at the sight of a ghost, those who encounter Lady Douglas have stated that she has a calming presence and that they felt no fear when they saw her. During her life, Lady Douglas was married to Sir Donald MacDonald on the 24th of July, 1662. MacDonald served as the 10th Chief of Sleet, which is located on the Isle of Skye, also in Scotland. They would be married for 22 years, until 1684, when Lady Douglas accused MacDonald of being unfaithful, and a lawsuit ensued. Lady Douglas isn't the only white lady who's said to haunt Scotland. The town of Dornoch is home to the Skibbo Castle, which is said to be haunted by a wailing white lady who lost her life at the hands of a servant while living in the building. Balvenie Castle in Dufftown is also the sighting of not only a lady in white, but also a band of ghostly horses that have been sighted as recently as 1994, though it's not been mentioned who this white spirit may belong to. Then there's the spirit at the Royal Circus Hotel that's been sighted since the 1970s. Three porters who worked at the hotel stated that they saw a beautiful, tall woman in long, dark hair moving through the property dressed in all white. They were so scared at this apparition that they started working in pairs until an exorcism was performed. As for the ghost of Lady Douglas, many people maintain that it is indeed real, but that she doesn't mean to scare anyone or bring them any harm. Number 3. Many people are fascinated by tales of druids that are rumored to have lived a long time ago. And while it's all but certain that they did exist, we have very little information on who they were or what their practices were. It's been suggested that they did keep records and that these may have been stored in a library on Iona Island, which lies just off the coast of Scotland. Those who believe in this theory think that these manuscripts may contain ancient knowledge that has since been forgotten and that they might be rediscovered one day. Saint Columba reached the island in 536 AD, though many people believe that he didn't intend to land there and that he was drawn to the island by some unseen spiritual force. But once he and his 13 followers arrived, they decided to take the land for themselves and had to fight off Druid elders to do so. They were successful, and the Druids had no choice but to find sanctuary elsewhere on the island, where they then decided to construct the library wherein they stored manuscripts containing much of their knowledge, despite it being said that they weren't in the habit of writing anything down. These aren't the only valuable texts that could be present on Iona Island, though. It's been suggested that when Rome fell to King Fergus II in 410 AD, many of that city's libraries were raided and the books that were stolen were then brought to the island, specifically to the Druids' library for safekeeping. These texts included works by prominent philosophers who hailed from Greece and Persia, and if they're ever found, they could be very revelatory, and many people have set out to find these volumes without any success. 
this could be because these books were never brought to the island in the first place. Historian and author Dr. William Ferguson has stated that he doubts the books were ever present on Iona Island, and that if they were, they would have been lost a long time ago. But those who believe the books to be real point to an account by a philosopher who lived during the 14th century. He claimed that he found a mysterious book while he was on the island, and this inspired him to write his book called The History of the Scottish People. His claim hasn't gained much traction with modern historians, though, as he isn't seen as a very influential philosopher, and hence there's much doubt whether he was being truthful about his discovery and its influence on his work. It is known, though, that after St. Columba built the first church on the island, he also created a scriptorium, from where many monks created manuscripts that contained poetry and copied works from other important books. One of these books is still on display at Trinity College in Dublin, so it's certain that these works did indeed exist. But this is, however, the only book that's ever been found, and while it's been suggested that the others were destroyed by Viking invaders, some historians believe that they were hidden for safekeeping and are still present somewhere on the island. While many archaeological digs have been undertaken in search of these books, none have been found, and we may never know whether they ever really existed. Number 2. Walter Powell was born to Thomas Powell, a callous and uncaring mine owner who was held responsible for a tragedy that took place at the Diffrin coal mine that was located in Wells during the 1840s. He had a wealthy upbringing, but after his father was brought to task for the unsafe work conditions that he created in his mines, he decided to use his wealth for good, and he decided to relocate to Wiltshire, England in the 1860s, where he became an MP. During this time, he became well-known and much loved in the community, earning the nickname the Poor Man's Friend, since he provided much-needed coal to less fortunate people in the area. But Powell also had other interests. He delighted in finding new inventions, such as magic lanterns that had just been invented. And before long, he took a marked interest in hot air ballooning, something that was only accessible by the rich at the time. Deciding that he wanted to become a balloonist himself, Powell trained at the Crystal Palace Company, and at one point received instruction from Henry Coxwell, who was a well-known aeronaut at the time. Coxwell would later state that Powell was too much of a handful as he had too much energy and seemed irresponsible at times, so he felt that someone else should take up the task of teaching him how to pilot a balloon properly. But Howell persevered and eventually bought his own balloon, completing many flights in 1881. He also took a keen interest in other pilots, one of which was Captain J.L.B. Templer, who he assisted in taking meteorological readings from his balloon. With his newfound passion for ballooning very much intact, Powell invited Templar and a third man, only known as A. Ag Gardner, to accompany him in a military balloon, the Saladin, on the 10th of December, 1881. This balloon differed from the rest in that it didn't use hydrogen as fuel, since it was very expensive, but instead relied on used coal gas to stay afloat. They set out across Somerset and Devon, in less than ideal conditions since visibility was limited, and before long they were surprised to hear the sound of waves crashing, revealing that they were approaching the English Channel. This caused the three men to panic, and Templar immediately opened one of the balloon's valves, causing it to descend too quickly, and the balloon hit the ground hard, ejecting both him and Ag Gardner. With the two men now absent from the balloon, it became much lighter, and Powell didn't have enough time to get out, resulting in him being carried upward with no control. Templar grabbed the valve line and attempted to bring the balloon under control, but he was unable to do so. And the last sight that he had of Powell was as he looked over the side of the basket and waved at the two men below. He felt that Powell had enough time to jump out of the basket, but suggested that he was either too scared to do so, since he may have been injured, or he may have been planning to use his experience to bring it down on a nearby beach. Failing this, Templar felt that Powell could make it across the channel to France, as this would not have been hard to do. But neither Powell nor the balloon was ever seen again, and it could only be speculated what happened to it. During a search, the only thing that was found was a thermometer from the balloon that contained a single human hair. Though it isn't known whether it belonged to Powell or not, and the mystery of what happened to the hapless aeronaut will likely never be solved. Number 1. The village of Kuldara, located in India, prospered until the 13th century, 
but it came to an inexplicable end that's resulted in rumors that it's cursed and haunted by the spirits of those who once lived there. During its heyday, it was inhabited by Palawal Brahmins, and it was during this time that Salem Singh approached the village chief and demanded that he and the chief's daughter get married. The chief suggested this to his daughter, but she was immediately dead set against the union, and Singh's proposal was outright rejected. This caused the inhabitants of the village to become fearful of what might happen, since Singh was a powerful man, and so they decided to flee. But as they did so, it's said that they laid a curse on the village that would see it remain uninhabited for all time. If anyone were to attempt to live there, the curse would take full effect, bringing misfortune to anyone who ignored it. Today, the village is nothing but a set of ruins, but the curse is still said to be very active, and yet people still flock there to experience its history. But many have vowed to never return after they experienced strange and inexplicable events while exploring the ruins. Some people claim that the very air in the village is different from its surroundings, describing it as thick and almost paranormal in nature. They've also reported hearing footsteps only to find that they're alone, resulting in rumors that the site is haunted by the spirits of villagers who once lived there. Others have reported seeing shadows in their peripheral vision, and that they could hear strange ghostly voices that seem to emanate from the very air itself. Thanks to these experiences, the village has become an attraction for paranormal investigators, many of whom have reported their own strange sightings. These include strange sounds that could not be tracked down, lights that flicker despite there being no source, and even full-bodied apparitions that appear as if out of thin air, only to disappear from sight again as if they were never really there. Others have described feeling a strange heaviness in the air, and that they had a distinct feeling that they were not welcome in the village's ruins. These sightings and experiences have lured many tourists to the area, and hence the Indian government has taken steps to preserve as much of it as possible. This will give many more people the opportunity to investigate these strange and otherworldly claims in the future, and it may just be possible for these tales to either be confirmed or debunked. Whether this strange activity is the result of an ancient curse, or just overactive imagination is still up for debate but it's certain that the Koldara village is considered by many as a cursed place that's to be avoided at all costs. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.